Welcome everyone, and thanks for joining today's RAND Remote Conversation. I'm Andy Hohen, Senior Vice President of Research and Analysis here at RAND. We're kicking off our 2021 event series with today's talk on ways to stem the tide of America's drug problems. While COVID-19 has been the issue at the forefront of our minds and news headlines, drug use and addiction and overdose deaths have not gone away. Evidence suggests the country's drug problems have actually intensified since the pandemic started. Today, my colleague, Bo Kilmer, director of the RAND Drug Policy Research Center and RAND's inaugural Macaulay Chair in Drug Policy Innovation, will discuss RAND's efforts to identify and evaluate new and creative solutions to tackle the most pressing drug problems and to help save lives. Bo's research lies at the intersection of public health and public safety, with special emphasis on crime control, substance use, illicit markets, and public policy. His publications have appeared in leading journals like the New England Journal of Medicine, and his commentaries have been published by CNN, the Los Angeles Times, New York Times, and Wall Street Journal, among other outlets. He co-authored the comprehensive book on the past, present, and future of illegal synthetic opioids, which was published by RAND with the support of philanthropic contributions. You'll hear more about this work today and about how our researchers are using analysis to strengthen and safeguard our communities, which is a priority of RAND's Tomorrow Demands Today fundraising campaign. We are enormously grateful for the generous support of Jack McCauley, whose recent campaign gift will foster drug policy innovation at RAND and help improve people's lives. I encourage you to learn more about our campaign at campaign.rand.org. I hope you'll stay connected to RAND and stay tuned for more opportunities to engage with our terrific RAND experts. Now, let's welcome Bo. Thank you, Andy, for the warm introduction. And I wanna thank Jack McCauley for his generous gift to RAND to support our work on drug policy uh, and building safer and healthier communities. Uh, it really is an honor for me to serve as the inaugural uh, McCauley Chair in Drug Policy Innovation at RAND. Uh, I've spent more than half my life uh, doing drug policy research at RAND. I started as an intern, as an undergrad, and I never really left. <laughs> uh, the work is just so fascinating and it makes a difference in people's lives. And uh, I've been very fortunate to work with uh, such a great uh, set of colleagues. And uh, so Jack, thank you uh, very much for this opportunity. It's also a pleasure for me to kick off the uh, RAND Remote uh, Speaker Series for 2021. Now, I know that a lot of us would just like to forget that 2020 uh, ever happened, but we can't. We also can't forget that before the pandemic, we were dealing with a different public health emergency. Now, I know many of you have probably seen a chart like this, which shows drug over overdose deaths over time. And we see that since 2010, more than a half a million people died from a drug overdose in the United States. And you can see right around 2017, there was some hope that we may have been at the peak and that, uh, uh, that the numbers may actually end up declining, but it turns out that is not the case. And in fact, we see that, especially since uh, 2014, 2015, what's really been driving the overdose deaths have been the uh, synthetic opioids. And these are largely, uh, these are fentanyls or fentanyl analogs that are illegally produced. Um, one thing you have to keep in mind, though, when you see these charts showing drug overdose deaths is they typically don't include deaths for, that are just related to alcohol overdoses, which are about 2000 a year. Uh, so much lower kind of compared to what we see with some of the other substances. However, we know that uh, each year. Um, nearly 100,000 Americans die from alcohol related causes, whether it be you know, drunk driving crashes, violence, uh, other medical conditions. Uh, so the numbers on this chart aren't completely comparable, but the thing to keep in mind is alcohol is a drug and it kills a lot of people each year. And so when we have these discussions about drug policy reforms and trying to, you know, trying to reduce drug related violence, alcohol has to be part of these uh, conversations. Now, while COVID may have pushed our um, problems with substance use, you know, kind of to the back burner, no, they are still boiling over. 
few months ago, ran research documented how alcohol consumption, especially binge drinking uh, among amongst women, has increased during the pandemic. Um, and new data from the Centers for Disease Control Prevention show that between June 2019 and May of 2020, more than 80,000 people died from a drug overdose. This set a new 12 month record. And in San Francisco, the death toll from overdose deaths in 2020 was actually three times higher than it was for COVID. Now, part of this is just a tribute to how seriously San Francisco has taken the pandemic. Um, but it's also because fentanyl has flooded the market in San Francisco and uh, increasingly um, uh, related to the, uh, the overdose death totals uh, in the city. So what is Rand doing about uh, addressing these uh, uh, drug problems? Well, uh, you know, for more than 30 years, RAND's Drug Policy Research Center has conducted research uh, to help decision makers in the United States and throughout the world uh, address issues related to alcohol and other drugs. You know, I've got uh, colleagues that are developing prevention programs, others that are trying to figure out well, which treatments or combination of treatments work best for different types of substance use disorders or mental health disorders. Uh, we do a lot in terms of the uh, the intersection between drug policy and criminal justice, the economics of these markets. And then we just also do a lot of uh, policy analysis and program evaluation. And, you know, for example, Rand has created some, uh, you know, has created an evidence based prevention program for schools. And it's also done something similar for communities. We're actually in the process right now of trying to figure out whether or not if we combine these two efforts in the same community, whether or not we get kind of additional uh, benefits. Uh, compared to them, uh, to just doing them separately. And, you know, we also spend a lot of time trying to identify innovative approaches uh, to addressing uh, some of these drug problems. You know, if there is research available, we'll do our best to synthesize it and try to figure out what studies are good, which ones are maybe less helpful, and then try to translate that information, uh, you know, to uh, decision makers. But oftentimes, uh, you know, the research on these innovative programs just may not exist. So if we can actually find the funding, uh, we'll do it ourselves. So today I want to talk about two innovative projects uh, that, uh, we, that we're working on at RAND intended to save lives and uh, reduce addiction. One is about the future of fentanyl and other synthetic opioids, and the other is focused on losing your license to drink alcohol. Now, with the commitment from RAND's President Michael Rich and with the generous support of RAND donors, uh, we wrote a book offering a systematic assessment of the past, present, and future, uh, or possible futures, of synthetic opioids in the United States. It was rooted in secondary data analysis, literature reviews, with the international case studies, uh, a lot of key informant interviews with people in the United States and abroad. And the goal of the project really is to provide decision makers researchers, uh, media outlets, as well as the public with insights that can help improve their understanding of the synthetic opioid problem and how to respond to it. Now, I'm gonna step back and, and talk a little bit about, about fentanyl. I mean, fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that was synthesized 60 years ago and it's commonly used in medicine. Uh, I wanna make it clear that the, when we talk about the fentanyl problem here in the United States, we're largely talking about uh, illegally produced fentanyl. So there is some diversion from legal sources, but that's not what's causing most of the death. Most of the death is coming from the illegally produced fentanyl and kind of other synthetic opioids. And we have had outbreaks uh, with the illegally produced fentanyl in the past, but today's outbreak is much more deadly for a few different reasons. Uh, first of all, just in terms of location, you know, the prior outbreaks were fairly localized. And while in the United States, fentanyl has hit the East Coast harder than the West Coast, uh, it's, you know, we're now seeing a lot of problems here in California. Um, so it's not localized, although we have some regional variation here in the United States, especially not only in terms of uh, synthetic opioids, but the types of synthetic opioids that are being used. Also in terms of duration, you know, with the previous outbreaks, they generally lasted maybe up to three years. Uh, for the current outbreak we're dealing with now, we're not, um, it's now uh, been about seven or eight years uh, that we've been dealing with the problem. And also the chemicals. Um, early on, the focus may have been just on fentanyl or maybe one of the analogs, but today we're seeing dozens of, uh, of different uh, synthetic opioids kind of hitting the market. You know, some are related to fentanyl, some aren't. Um, and this is, you know, adds a lot more instability uh, to the market. Uh, in terms of the source, you know, primarily in the earlier outbreaks, there may have been one chemist in one lab who you know, knew uh, 
knew what to do to produce it. Today, almost all of it is either being imported from China or from Mexico, where in Mexico sometimes look at the, they'll import the precursor chemicals, then they make, make the fentanyl there in Mexico, and then kind of ship it up north. And finally, just in terms of distribution, um, the earlier outbreaks, there were a few organized networks. It's nothing like it is today, where we've got trafficking organizations, but also just the internet. And we're not just talking about purchases on the dark web. You could just go on right now into Google and, uh, and type it in and with a credit card. You can get fentanyl delivered to you. It's illegal, uh, but there are a lot of different uh, companies that are, that are reporting to do this. Um, so today's uh, situation is much different. And uh, it's also important to note that the overdose crisis today is largely driven by suppliers. Most people um, aren't asking for fentanyl. They're trying to avoid it, but the fentanyl is being mixed into the heroin or sometimes it's mixed in with uh, or into counterfeit pills. And so people may not even know that there's fentanyl in there. Now, of course, there are some markets, for example, in San Francisco, where people are explicitly asking for fentanyl. Um, but for the most part, this has been spreading because suppliers have wanted to add fentanyl into these products because it's cheaper for them. So it kind of helps them with their bottom line. Now, in the, re, uh, in, in the book, we spent some time kind of looking at, you know, previous cases in the United States as well as uh, international experiences. And we identified four possible scenarios for the U.S. crisis. One could be flash and recede. The second could be that synthetic opioids are just added to the drug mix. A third could be that synthetic opioids largely replace heroin. Or we could have a situation like in San Francisco where you've got a coexisting heroin market where people will sell, either sell you a bag of heroin or a bag of fentanyl. And it's hard to predict how this is gonna play out in the United States. And we suspect that there's gonna be a fair amount of regional variation, but we definitely were able to rule out that uh, it's gonna be flash and recede. This is a problem that we're going to be dealing with for quite some time. So what could the federal government do? You know, we list a number of different options. And, uh, you know, we find that in places that are swamped with fentanyl, um, it's gonna be important to consider new approaches uh, to reducing exposure. We also have to get creative about disrupting supply, and we also have to improve monitoring and surveillance. So, you know, with respect to uh, reducing exposure, I mean, this isn't like a traditional drug epidemic, uh, so let's not treat it like one. Uh, so we really do need some outside the box thinking. And so, you know, we've, we're, we're doing a better job of increasing access to medications for opioid use disorder, for buprenorphine and methadone, and, and also abstinence-based treatments. Um, but not all of those treatments work for everyone. And sometimes people need, uh, you know, other types of or other forms of treatment. And uh, so one of the things that uh, we um, recommend in the, in the report is that the federal government should invest in clinical trials of medication treatments that are currently not used in the United States. Um, this isn't going to solve the problem, but for some people, you know, for whom, you know, some of the medications hadn't been working and abstinence-based treatment hasn't worked uh, as well, um, this may help them and, and may keep them alive. Um, also, uh, you know, supervising consumption and drug content testing, they're not going to solve the crisis, uh, but they can reduce harm. And, uh, you know, with respect to supervising consumption, um, you know, a lot of the discussion now is about creating separate uh, facilities where people can come in and they take the drugs that they purchase on the street, then they use them in a, um, in, in a sterile environment uh, with someone who's watching them and so can react if they overdose. Um, but also, uh, we can think about supervising consumption in other ways as well. You know, for example, developing new apps to make it easier for people, especially if they're at home alone, to have someone monitoring them. There's a lot we could do here in terms of supervising consumption, as well as with drug content testing. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the actual kind of uh, bricks and mortar facilities, um, there are about 150 of them operating kind of throughout the world. And uh, there have been a few jurisdictions in the United States that have wanted to kind of make this happen, um, but it's been blocked by the, uh, by the uh, federal government. The Department of Justice uh, believes that they are illegal and they have been fighting them. And so there are a couple of different options um, that the federal government has here. They actually, you know, they could pass a law indicating that supervised consumption sites uh, would, be, um, would no longer be prohibited uh, uh, by the Controlled Substances Act, or, you know, they could release a memo indicating that they, you know, that, hey, why do we think this may be illegal under federal law? We're not going to block pilot programs, you know, if certain guidelines are met. For example, maybe if, uh, you know, if there was included provisions such as, 
you know, making sure that local public health, law enforcement, and prosecutors all maybe send a memorandum of understanding that's you know about implementation. Maybe that they're subject to strong evaluation. There's a lot of things that could be done here, um, but uh, I mean this would largely happen at the local level. But currently, the federal government is blocking this. We also got to get creative about disrupting supply. Now, there's no reason to believe that multi-year sentences for low-level suppliers will make a difference. And we've even seen some places pass these drug homicide laws. So if you share your drugs with someone and they overdose and die, that you could be held um, uh, responsible. And there's just absolutely no evidence that uh, putting someone away for multiple years because of that makes any difference. Um, you know, as I said, uh, that you, we've got a fair amount of these interactions happening on the internet. It's hard to know how much. Um, but so disrupting web sales is a low-hanging fruit here. You know, whether it be hacking into these, uh, these companies or setting up fake sites, there's a lot that actually could be done. And also just being able to um, detect some of these uh, substances and they continue to change. Um, you know, we could set up X prize type competitions. In fact, the federal government did this uh, with their federal opioid detection challenge. Uh, but I mean, they only put 1.5 million into this. I mean, this is a serious social problem. And so I, I applaud the, the, the agencies that did uh, kind of invest in this uh, competition, but we need to be doing a lot more and putting a lot more resources into this. And the final thing that could be done is just to improve monitoring and surveillance. I mean, the United States took this seriously when we were dealing with the HIV epidemic. We have not been taking this seriously with respect to uh, our, our current uh, overdose crisis. You know, many labs, medical examiners don't even have the tech they need to be able to detect fentanyl analogs. And, uh, you know, another option is that we could, uh, the United States could embrace wastewater testing like they do in Europe and Australia. In fact, cities in Europe have been developing and deploying this technique for decades where they actually get wastewater and they look at the metabolites uh, for various substances. And they've demonstrated success in delivering near real time information about shifting drug use patterns uh, in various markets. And a couple of years ago uh, in Australia, they, um, they were using wastewater testing and they found that fentanyl consumption may have actually doubled outside of the capital city jurisdictions uh, between 2017 and 2018. Now, there are limits, you know, this type of wastewater testing approach uh, it might only work in areas with high connectivity uh, to municipal water systems, but this is cheap. And this is something that can allow us to get, allow communities uh, to get a better sense of the different substances that are coming in, um, as well as, uh, you know, they're, you know, they're now um, being able to develop methods to be, to try to figure out the total amount actually being consumed. So there's a lot of opportunity here. This isn't expensive. Other countries are doing it. This is something I think the federal government should be taking seriously. Now I want to switch gears a little bit and uh, and talk about some of the work that we've been doing on alcohol. Now, when someone turns 21 uh, years old in the United States, they essentially get a license to purchase and consume as much alcohol as they want. But here's a question. Should we ever revoke this license to drink? for those whose alcohol use leads them to repeatedly threaten public health and safety. So here I'm not talking about an actual license, but it's just this idea that we allow everyone to drink. At some point, uh, should we maybe revoke it or suspend it? And in fact, this is something that they've been doing in South Dakota for nearly 15 years. Um, so around 2003, 2004, um, the governor at the time put together a blue ribbon commission because he wanted to figure out a way to reduce incarceration. You know, he didn't want to build any more prisons. And uh, there was a new attorney general at the time uh, who was also on this task force or blue ribbon commission. And he said, hey, well, I've got an idea for you. You know, a lot of the people that are coming to our prisons and coming back to our prisons are, 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 are ending up there because of alcohol related crimes. And oftentimes when folks are after they've been arrested and they're out on bond or they're on probation, we will tell them don't drink and don't go to bars, but we never enforce it. So, uh, so, you know, this attorney general said, well, back when I was a prosecutor in this small county, when I would tell people not to drink, I would actually have them come into the sheriff's office once in the morning and once at night, every single day and blow into a breathalyzer. If there was any alcohol in their system, uh, they would go to jail for a night or two. So the idea was to you know, provide a swift, certain, but very modest sanction to kind of hold them accountable. And so the attorney general said, why don't we try this as a pilot program? And, you know, I think a lot of people were pretty skeptical, right? They, you know, you know, how are you going to get someone who's been drinking for 25 years just to stop, let alone kind of come in twice a day? 
But, you know, he was the attorney general and he knew some judges. And so they were able to start a pilot program in 2005. And this eventually became what was known as the 24-7 sobriety program. And there are these three different components. You've got, you know, abstinence order. So you're ordered not to drink. Uh, you have very frequent alcohol testing. You know, most of the people participating, you know, they go in once in the morning and once at night every single day and blow into a breathalyzer. And then you have this swift, certain amount of sanctions. It's typically a night or two in uh, in jail. That's how they've implemented this in South Dakota. Now, this program is controversial in some circles uh, because it doesn't require people to go to treatment. So it's not like a regular drug court or DUI treatment court. Uh, the program doesn't prohibit anyone from going to treatment. It just says, we don't care how you do it, but we want you coming in twice a day and, uh, and, and, and testing. Um, and testing negative for alcohol. Um, but of course, you know, South Dakota is a rural area and there are, you know, some people just really couldn't, you know, they could, you know, they couldn't drive in twice a day. So over time, they began introducing some of these continuous alcohol monitoring bracelets. And so this was kind of state of the art maybe 10 years ago. And so these are bracelets that you wear, you know, 90 days at a time. You can wear them in a the shower. You can't wear them and uh, you, you can't go swimming with them. But essentially every 30 minutes, it tests your sweat for alcohol. It stores that information. Then when you go home, radio frequencies send that information from your ankle to a, a to a modem. That information then goes to a private company, and then they can determine whether or not you've been drinking. And now there are kind of there are multiple types of uh, these products on the market. But as I said, this was kind of state of the art 10 years ago. You've also got, uh, you know, some places are using these remote breath devices, which may be the width of three or four iPhones. And you get a text message from your probation officer. You pull this thing out. You put a straw into it. You blow into it. It's got facial recognition software, so it knows it's you. So, you know, within 60 seconds, they have confirmation that it's you. They know whether or not you've been drinking and they have your GPS coordinates. And so as you can imagine, these technologies are only going to get better and cheaper over time. But it's how this information is used that's really going to determine whether or not this has any significant implications for public health and public safety. So I so the, the pilot program started in 2005. It was around 2009 that I first learned about the program. You know, someone came up to me and said, Bo, I know you've been at RAN for a while. You primarily work on illegal drugs, but I got to tell you about this program in South Dakota that primarily focuses on alcohol. And so he starts telling me, how in some of these counties, hundreds of people will come in every morning and every night. And my jaw just dropped. I was just kind of in disbelief. I, it just didn't seem like, how could that actually be sustainable? And actually, that, can I have uh, that many people doing this, you know, every morning and, uh, and every evening? So, uh, so after talking to this guy about it, I looked into it a little bit. And then I went to uh, kind of my boss at the time at RAND, the head of the Safety and Justice Unit, and said, Hey, look, I don't know if this is going to turn into anything, but I just learned about this really interesting and innovative program in South Dakota. Would you, are there, could you find me some money so it could cover my time so I could go road trip South Dakota and actually kind of see whether or not there's something here? And he was able to do it. He was able to find the funds and he's like, go for it. And so um, I ended up going to South Dakota and I made the mistake of going in the middle of February. <laughs> I mean, I'm from, it was freezing. I mean, I, I'm from Northern Michigan, but being out in California had made me soft. Uh, so it's middle of February and I start going to some of these different counties and watching hundreds of people come in every morning and every night. And I was really kind of getting the sense that there was something here, but, uh, but what I thought needed to be done was an independent evaluation. So I went to the attorney general and said, look, you need to have an independent and rigorous evaluation done. So you'll have a better sense of kind of, you know, is, you know, how much of an effect this program is having. And so what that would mean is you would have to open up your books to me. You'd have no control over the results. But if you could promise me that you would give me the data I would need, I could probably go to one of the federal agencies and, and maybe get some funding for this. And he said, go for it. So, uh, so yeah, so we got to, um, so that was in, in 2010. And so we've now been researching this program in South Dakota and in other states uh, for the last 10 years. And, you know, this isn't just some small scale program. We estimated that between 2005 and 2017, that more than 30,000 unique 24-7 um, uh, sobriety participants in South Dakota accumulated more than 5 million days without a confirmed drinking event. 
I mean, our back of the envelope calculations suggested that 6% of all adult males had gone through this program. And so, um, uh, and yeah, and we've got another cut of the data, and I think that number is now closer to 40,000 people. So this is a big program in South Dakota. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, over time we've published a number of studies, and uh, um, there are two I want to focus on here where we were looking at the, we were taking advantage of the fact that the program was implemented in different counties at different times. So we actually looked to see, well, after a county began, you know, implementing the program, what happened to various outcomes? So if we start at the very bottom here, we found that after counties in South Dakota adopted the program, um, there was about a 12% reduction in the total number of arrests for repeat drunk driving or DUI. That's not an individual level risk factor, that's 12% of the, the total number uh, of uh, repeat DUI arrests. We also found that the program um, reduced uh, arrests for domestic violence by about 9%. We were initially kind of surprised by this um, because most of the uh, most of the people in the program aren't there for domestic violence. Um, but it just goes to show that if you get someone to reduce their alcohol consumption for six months or nine months or 12 months at a time, not only can this reduce the risk of uh, uh, driving under the influence, but it may have some spillover effects. Um, when we looked at what happened to, in counties after they adopted the program, uh, in terms of total traffic crashes, if you look at total traffic crashes, we didn't see anything. However, there was some suggestive evidence uh, that when we focused on traffic crashes involving males aged 18 to 40, who are kind of the uh, the prime target of the program, that we did see a, uh, a, a small reduction, uh, suggestive evidence of a small reduction. But we also, we looked beyond just kind of arrests and traffic crashes, and we also began looking at uh, total mortality, because at RAND, and a number of other research institutes, we've got to access on, on, or information on every single person who's died in the United States. So we kind of focused that analysis on South Dakota, and we found that after counties adopted the program, uh, we saw a, a significant reduction in the total number of adults who died. And sure enough, if we separate that out and get more specific, those deaths are concentrated in cardiovascular and injuries, kind of what we would expect. And so, this research, uh, these uh, the first two studies that come out of this, um, really have made an impact. Uh, so based on this uh, research, uh, the National Institute of Justice now considers 24-7 uh, sobriety a promising program. It's been listed by the Stanford Network on Addiction Policy as evidence-informed policy. Um, our RAND research has been used and cited in legislation to try to adopt 24-7 in other states. And our research has also helped um, uh, to uh, implement a version of the program and get it passed uh, in the United Kingdom. Now, there, are, as I said, we've been working on this for about 10 years. We've got some other research showing that it's having um, well, a significant uh, uh, effect in South Dakota, or I'm sorry, in North Dakota. And so, I mean, but there's still a lot of big questions. You know, can this really work outside of the Great Plains? You know, how much, uh, how long should people be in the program? You know, should it be 90 days, 180 days, a year? And also, what is the, the minimum kind of level of sanction that you need to kind of produce these deterrent effects? You know, the way they do it in South Dakota, you're spending a night or two in jail. But what if it was only four hours in jail? Or what if it was house arrest? What if it was something else? So I think we've got a lot more to learn here. Um, but, uh, but definitely, the, the research suggests that this program can uh, significantly influence both public health and public safety outcomes. So just... A few concluding thoughts. I mean, this is just uh, kind of a little bit of a taste of, of what I've been up to with my colleagues at the Rand Drug Policy Research Center. Um, as you can see, uh, we don't avoid controversy. I mean, we can't. When you're working on substance use policy, uh, it gets very controversial. Uh, but not only within the United States, but around the world, people come to Rand for the objective insights and uh, and for information on what is known and what is not known about uh, some of these different innovative policies. Well, we have time to answer a few questions that were submitted to uh, Rand Remote at Rand.org. Uh, the first one is from Michelle, and she asks, has a fentanyl outbreak spread at the same rate across the entire country, or is it a regional problem? You know, that's a great, uh, great question. And, you know, as I said, the pro our problems with fentanyl really, with illegally produced fentanyl, really began to pick up 2013-2014. And, uh, even when you begin kind of looking at a map of the United States, you see that early on it was largely concentrated 
in the Northeast and the Midwest. Um, it, uh, we do now see uh, you know, fentanyl and the analogs kind of moving west of the Mississippi River. You know, and as I mentioned earlier, San Francisco is uh, dealing with a very serious uh, fentanyl problem now. Uh, so I wouldn't say it's a national problem yet, uh, but it looks like we're heading in that direction. Uh, the other issue is we have data lags. You know, so when we're using overdose data, um, you know, if we want to look at that by state, we actually only have those data right now going through 2018. And so we definitely kind of see this uh, shift out west. And that's why I think, you know, if we were to have a national uh, kind of wastewater testing program, as I discussed earlier, it would allow us to get a better sense of kind of uh, which drugs are being used and how drug markets are changing. So thank you very much for the question. It looks like there's a question from Jim about how does being a faculty member at Party Brand Graduate School contribute to innovation and research? Um, well, I've been very fortunate in that I've been able to work with a number of our uh, PRGS students over the years. And in fact, you know, when I mentioned earlier, I started doing that research on that 24-7 sobriety program uh, in 2010. I was very fortunate to uh, uh, do a lot of that work with a, uh, a PRGS student, Greg Majette. He was fantastic, and like his <laughs> his programming skills were much better than mine. And uh, and uh, we got to uh, be very close. And his he ended up doing his entire dissertation on the twenty four seven program. Stayed at RAM for a while, and then uh, was able to get a position at uh, one of the best criminology departments in the country at the University of Maryland. And so very fortunate that I still get to collaborate with Greg. Uh, but I've been able to work with a number of students. I think that's a real. Uh, a uh, real advantage to working at RAND. Okay, uh, there's another question. It says, um, have you studied whether the 24-7 program is more effective when combined with alcohol use disorder treatment? Uh, no, I have not, and yes, I would like to. <laughs> you know, as I mentioned, most of the research we've been doing so far has largely been, you know, secondary data analyses, kind of looking at how the program has been implemented. And, uh, but one could imagine a scenario where you could combine 24-7 with some type of uh, alcohol use disorder treatment just to figure out whether or not you make it better, uh, um, you know, there may be better outcomes. And so this is something that I think we would have to, uh, you know, maybe start doing some randomized controlled trials. And I kind of alluded to that uh, during the talk. But also beyond just, in, you know, seeing what would happen if we incorporated treatment, I also think we have a lot to learn about the positive incentives. Right. I mean, this the, the this program makes a difference by creating a credible deterrent threat. It's all it's largely about the stick, even though it's kind of a, a small sanction if you do get uh, uh, punished. But there's also a lot of research, especially in the substance use field, showing that uh, positive incentives can also make a difference. So I would love to begin doing some studies where we look at kind of how 24-7 is uh, implemented you know, kind of in South Dakota and compare that with an approach that uses both positive uh, incentives and negative incentives to see whether or not you may get longer lasting effects. So there's a lot more we have to learn about this. And uh, but a lot of that, uh, a lot of those questions we won't be able to answer until we start doing some um, some randomized control trials and finding some jurisdictions that are willing to kind of help us learn uh, about uh, different aspects of the program. Okay, and it looks like we've got time for one last question. Uh, Nathan writes, how has RAM been contributing to discussions about the future of marijuana policy in the US and abroad? And I just have to say, <laughs> if you would have told me 10 years ago that I would have been spending the bulk of my time working on cannabis policy, you know, I wouldn't have believed you. Uh, but, you know, people have been debating cannabis legalization at dinner parties and in dorm rooms for decades. Uh, but around 2009, 2010, this one, it seemed like the conversation was getting a bit more serious. Legislation had been introduced uh, to the California legislature, and there were also discussions that there was uh, going to be a ballot initiative about cannabis legalization uh, in California in 2010. You know, and being, you know, being based in California, you know, it's kind of watching both sides of the debate kind of talking past one another, using questionable numbers. And so we thought kind of as RAND researchers that we could, you know, kind of help inform these discussions, help people understand, here's what we know, here's what we don't know, here are the things you need to be thinking about if you're going to go down this pathway. And I have to tell you, it was really hard to get funding. You know, we went to a, you know, a number of different foundations and this issue was too controversial for them. They didn't want to touch it. Um, but fortunately, we were able to um, 
use some money that had been donated to RAND. Uh, we use a gift to use some of those funds to kind of help fund our initial research on this. And that report came out and a series of reports came out in 2010. They got up a lot of attention and we just kind of continued to do more work in the space. Um, you know, Rand, we don't have an official position on legalization, uh, but what we've been doing is really trying to help jurisdictions think through all of the different issues. Like if you're going to go down this pathway, here are the different things you, you need to know about taxing. Here's what you need to know about the health consequences. And uh, yeah, so over the past decade, we've worked with a number of different states as well as uh, different countries, helping them kind of think through these issues. And the work still continues. And um, you know, lately we uh, we've been doing a lot of work on social equity and uh, and and how to address social equity with changes in cannabis policy, and really trying to help kind of expand those discussions. And so, uh, yeah, so I'm 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 like I said, I I didn't realize we were going to be spending I was going to be spending this much of my time kind of working on this, but I'm glad I am. And man, we are contributing to these conversations. But I have to say, if it wasn't for those initial um, kind of uh, gifts to Rand. Um, you know, back in 2009, 2010, uh, I don't think we'd be in the situation that we are today. So once again, thank you for the great questions and thanks for listening. And like I said, if you have, if you want to reach out, uh, please just feel free to uh, send an email to Rand Remote, R-A-N-D-R-E-M-O-T-E at Rand.org. Thank you very much. 90210. 90022 90221 Our zip codes represent more than just the places where we live. They're a predictor of our health and the opportunities available to us. Education and job options. Outcomes like life expectancy. These can vary widely for people living in adjacent zip codes, only miles apart. Will we accept that a baby born in 25701, Huntington, West Virginia, a state with one of the highest rates of opioid-dependent newborns, will have fewer options than the baby born in 90404, Santa Monica, California? We won't. We can't sit by while our communities and the individuals within them are hurting. Not when every 15 minutes there's a baby born suffering from opioid withdrawal. Not when suicide rates are at their highest since World War II, or when life expectancy fell for three years in a row. U.S. communities are not the only ones in distress. From the bottom billion people and the poorest countries in which they live, hunger, disease, and natural disaster are existential threats. Many throughout the world have been forced to leave their homes, fleeing conflict and war, or they're driven from their places of birth by fires and floods, drought and food insecurity. These problems are decades in the making, but the dire consequences are being transmitted from generation to generation. If you think these issues are too complex to solve, think again. If you think the time has come to act, we agree. Bold solutions are needed to safeguard our communities today. Urgent action is needed to build resiliency and strengthen our communities for tomorrow. Imagine a tomorrow where opportunities for health, well-being, and success are in reach, regardless of circumstance or place of birth. Can you imagine a brighter tomorrow for all? We can. Tomorrow demands today.